Okay, Karen. I just turned it on. Am I? Is it working? I'm sorry. Okay, is mine on? All right. Well, welcome. Good to see you. Good to have a visitor. Lord bless you, ma'am. Good to have you here. Welcome. Uh, everyone survived 4th of July? Good. That's good. Uh, we're going to sing. Someone can hold that mic, uh, turn it on, because I'm going to turn mine off. Or Okay. Well, I'm just going to take this off. But otherwise, I'm the only one you're going to hear uh, with that. How about uh, what a friend we have in Jesus? All right? A couple of verses of that. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. to the Lord in prayer. Thy friends despise for sake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there great to be friends with Jesus, isn't it? What a blessing uh, to be friends with him. I'm going to stick this back on and uh, get all wired up. Again, good to have you here this evening. Uh, Fourth of July yesterday, we have several people gone, but we have uh, a good a crowd for our Bible study group this evening, and and uh, we welcome you here. Someone have a, a testimony that you want to share, or an answer to prayer that you would share? That uh, before we go to the Lord in prayer, anybody? Thank you for the opportunity. This is Thomas family. It's all your blessing. Yeah, how many were there at the character? Eighty nine. Wow, that's great. Uh, I'm looking for my. Well, that's uh, that's a blessing. Get to be with family. I'm glad uh, glad that you did. Anyone else with a a testimony you'd share? Yes. Well, great. That's great. Really? Well, I'm seeing the eye doctor on Friday, and they're going to be telling me I have to have that. So they already warned me. So 
you have you get old and you have uh, cataracts removed and then scar tissue comes in and you got to have that and that puts you to sleep for the cataracts or at least they did me but now they're going to laser with me I said you're going to have to strap my head down I'm <laughs> that's um, no way that thing starts coming at me and I'm going to dodge it. But that's a blessing for Doris, uh, Dolores. Anyone else with a prayer request? Uh, well, it's not just when you get old, I've already had two rounds of cataracts. Um, and my first one was underneath my eye, and then my second one was under <laughs> Well. Um, but also, I am currently in the process of moving to the right now. Okay. The Lord's good, isn't he? The Lord's good to us, takes care of us, knows our needs, and uh, so thankful for that. We can just praise him for that. Uh, Devin's out of town, Pastor Devin's out of town, and, and so uh, he sent uh, the first five uh, for the five minutes of prayer that we want to spend, uh, or longer if we need to. Uh, his prayer request is a blessing for me, it's a, a blessing. Uh, you see the heart of a pastor that, uh, because we're, we're prone to at prayer meeting, uh, requests, uh, prayer for the sick, and we should. But often we forget about the things of uh, the spiritual realm and uh, spiritual warfare. Here's Devin's request. Pray that God would give you an opportunity to share your faith this week. That's a good prayer request, isn't it? Uh, pray uh, for this week's services as we have Holly Caspers coming Sunday sharing about her ministry, uh, her mission ministry in, in New York. I'm looking forward to that service. And that'll be Sunday when everybody gets back home. And uh, pray for those traveling to the National the week following going to Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, the children that'll be in competition there. And I uh, pray that the Lord would put a burden on someone's heart uh, to drive one of the buses. Uh, they're needing a bus driver. Now, we open it up to prayer requests, all right? Anyone? Yeah. Amen. Now who's Diane's? All right. Well, let's thank the Lord for that. Other prayer requests that you might have. Ken from our Sunday school class is going to be in rehab. Ken is going to rehab uh, after his hospital stay of a couple of times and uh, now is headed to rehab okay let's remember Ken it's the gentleman in the wheelchair that comes in so okay okay anyone else okay Let's remember David, Carla's uncle. Who else? You have another? Drowning. Just a little one, three years old. Anyone else? What what was the name last name? Gorham.
All right. Anyone else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you that uh, you are our friend. And what a friend we have in Jesus. And we can bring all of our prayer requests, our, our burdens, our sins, and our grief to you. And uh, we do that tonight. We think of this Gorham family, the grieving family at the loss of that tragic loss and drowning of the little three-year-old. We thank you, Lord, for heaven, that heaven's real. And we just pray, the Lord, that you'd impart that by your spirit to the Gorham family, uh, even right now, as they grieve the loss of a grandchild, as a, uh, their child. And just pray for the whole family, all of them, as uh, they grieve the loss. We pray for the young man that was killed on Riverside Drive and we don't know the circumstances, but we know you do. We pray for that family and uh, lift them up. We pray for Carla's uh, uncle, David, and uh, you know his needs physically. And we just lift him up to you today and know that you're a great physician. We pray for Ken that attends church here that's, uh, that's uh, battling so many health issues right now and we lift him up before you uh, we're thankful for Dolores the, the, uh, Doris that uh, she has uh, gone through uh, this uh, surgery on her eyes again this, uh, and we just thank you Lord that uh, the outcome is really good and we just lift her up uh, to you she's even had one today a treatment and we just pray that you would bless her and God, we uh, pray for uh, uh, others uh, th that are in need of you today. Uh, we lift them up. We think of folks here at the, the church that are ongoing. Uh, we, we just pray for Joyce, Barbie. Lift her up to, to you, Lord. And uh, uh, we pray for her and her needs and uh, we pray for J.L. Dobbs family and for his daughter as she plans and prepares for a memorial service that'll be a few weeks away. But as uh, J.L. passed away, we pray especially that you would be near Etta right now. Surround her with your Holy Spirit and draw her close to your side, someone that she's believed in and had faith in for all these many years, now she's lost her husband and we just lift her up uh, before you tonight. And uh, then Lord, we think of uh, these requests that Pastor Devin has made tonight and uh, we lift them before you. We do pray. We pray God that each one of us would have opportunity in this, in this culture that we're living in, unbelieving culture, a lot of people without faith in Christ, so far away from God. God, uh, lead us to someone that we can share a witness uh, with, Lord, someone that needs you and perhaps family or friend or just someone we work with. We pray for uh, our church service uh, this Sunday in Holly. Uh, as uh, she, Holly Cosper, she shares uh, her story about uh, the work that's going on in uh, New York and we just uh, pray that you would bless her and especially anoint our worship service here. Pray for those that will be traveling the next week after this Sunday. They'll be traveling and going to Raleigh, North Carolina. A bunch of folks from the church and children competing in competition, Bible memory and, and the various uh, uh, Bible memory uh, activities and we just lift them up to you bless the young people I think uh, God will get to hear from them on Sunday night one last time before they head out and uh, we just uh, pray that you'd bless the ministry of this church in trying to put the word of God into children's hearts we think of the competition but that's just a small sidelight 
to the fact that these children are, are uh, hiding the Word of God in their heart. And uh, we just pray that you would bless them and, uh, and encourage those that work with uh, the children, Lord, and lift them up. We pray for youth service tonight. We pray uh, that you would be with Joel and Tara and the others that are involved in youth service and the children's activities even tonight. And uh, we lift them up before you. God, we need someone to drive one of our, our church vans. And then we uh, just pray that, Lord, you would lay that on someone's heart and bless. And then, Father, tonight we pray uh, that you bless in our Bible studies as we look at those seven churches that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. God, help us to learn the lessons from each one of them, each church with, with specific problems and, 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 and needs. And, God, we relate that to that happening 2,000 years ago, but God, we try to bring it to uh, uh, application today, in our day, and uh, help us to learn, we pray, and uh, put the Word of God in our hearts. Now bless us together, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, it's good to, to see you. We do uh, ask you to turn to the, the uh, third chapter of Revelation. We are going to look at uh, the church in Sardis. <clears throat> As we've been looking into Revelation, and I want to repeat again, uh, it's not all the part of Revelation that we don't understand that gives us a problem. It's, uh, it's very important for the parts that we do understand that we learn from those. And, and so uh, we're in chapter 3. Uh, Sardis uh, is a community. Uh, uh, it's an ancient city, a capital of Lydia, the country, and and a very important city. And like a lot of the ch uh, churches, those seven churches, uh, mostly in, in, um, in uh, uh, the, the Turkey area of, uh, around the Mediterranean. And uh, this, this particular uh, uh, church in Sardis is about 50 miles from the Ephesus church. We started with Ephesus, talked uh, about it. We've uh, uh, talked uh, about the church at Smyrna and Pergamos. And, uh, and uh, last week was uh, uh, the church, uh, someone remind me, uh, Thyatira. Uh, in chapter two, those four churches, and now we start with chapter three and uh, the church in Sardis. The main religion in that city, like most of them, was some sort of cult. It's kind of curious that the cult, uh, the uh, false doctrine that was uh, the prominent in Sardis uh, was uh, the, the cult that worshiped uh, and the temple there to Art Artemis, uh, and it was a nature cult. Now think of that. We, a couple of weeks ago, it was a, a false doctrine of the health thing. Uh, kind of the same issue today. You know, we uh, get caught up in that, and there is a lot of false teaching on on uh, our physical health. Well. The Sardis church, uh, the, not the church, but that city, the main uh, false theology being taught there dealt around nature. Uh, not so much considered a cult in our country, and I don't know the, all the science about it. I know what I've heard on both sides but one of the big issues facing uh, us today is uh, uh, the, the environment and, and uh, 
well, what's it called? Uh, uh, that the Earth is global warming, and and that seems to be things, things. I thought I did so well remembering the prayer requests. I don't think I left one. I may have. Don't tell me if I did. But now I can't even think of global warming. But that seems to, it's not a, not a religion, uh, so to speak, but uh, a lot of issues around that. It's kind of interesting that the church at Sardis, uh, the, that it was a, a nature kind of false theology. And you can get caught up in that. There used to uh, be a lot of, uh, lot of thought uh, in, in false theology about God being in everything, the trees. And it wasn't so far that, so much that that was far off because God created it all. Uh, but uh, the, the idea of, uh, of nature, uh, and it was built mostly, this nature cult uh, was built mostly on the idea of, of death, get this, death and rebirth, uh, that it's a natural thing, you know, that uh, uh, you die, but uh, the rebirth, uh, not talking about new life in Christ, not talking about going to heaven, but talking about that uh, you never really die. Uh, you do die, but you're, you're reborn somewhere in some way, in some fashion. And, and so that idea of, uh, goes way back uh, to there. It's not something uh, of the last few centuries, the idea that, uh, that, that you're, uh, you just become something else or you're reborn somewhere. Uh, Sardis was also known, like most of these cities, on the coast somewhere of uh, manufacture. Uh, in particular, uh, they they uh, were uh, uh, wool was uh, a big thing. Wool garments and and uh, it was also uh, important uh, military outpost, as most of these cities were. So it was a thriving city in one way. Uh, sad to say, this city. Sardis, uh, time had come and gone. It was a shadow of what it once was. So it was, it was people, lots of people leaving, and uh, the economy not all that good. And so its former splendor uh, had started fading. So did the church. Uh, the church at, at uh, Sardis had unfortunately become like the city of Sardis. It was alive and thriving in name only. And so we, we hear that and, and then we see the message to Sardis and the warning that it gives uh, uh, for churches, especially great churches, that are living on the past glory of the church, yesterday's victories. And so we're going to have Darla read the six verses. It's Revelation 3, uh, verses 1 through 6. And so Darla... I don't know if that's going to work for us, but uh, if it starts screaming, we'll not. To the angel in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, 
Repent. Verse 6. Okay. Thank you. The message to Sardis, first of all, just a reminder, who's the author? Who wrote this letter? Who worded this letter? John's hand wrote it, but it was from Jesus. The only, only book of the Bible that the author is Jesus. Uh, now that's kind of confusing because all of the word of God is inspired by God. But in a vision, John saw Jesus and told him to write these specific words. And so the warning as we see here is to a church that was great but now they're living on their past glory, their past victories. Listen, that's true about a lot of churches in America in 2023. Uh, Vance Havner would frequently remind his listeners uh, that spiritual ministries often go through four stages. It's the man that starts the ministry, a particular whatever ministry it might be. Then it becomes a movement. Uh, and then it becomes a well-oiled machine. And then it becomes a monument. A lot of, if you, you apply that to a church, uh, a lot of churches are like that. Started by some man that God, or woman, that God burdened to start that ministry. And, and it, then it becomes a monument. And, and that's kind of what Sardis had become a monument. They were in the monument stage, but there's still hope. Now the counselor, we've been looking at each one of these letters. We've been looking at the counselor, the commendation, uh, also the chastisement, then the challenge, and, and uh, uh, the counsel, and then the, the challenge. And so, uh, uh, we're, we're going to stay with that, but it's, of all the churches, this is the hardest one to stay with that outline. It's easy to do with the, the four that we've already studied. A little more difficult here, and I'm, I'll get into that. Uh, the first part of uh, uh, verse 1 says, Jesus holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. What are the seven spirits? They can be related just like the, the, the lampstand. They can be related to the churches and the stars related to the pastors. 
of those seven churches. He's the counselor. He holds them. So what's said about the counselor? God, Jesus Christ, holds this church in his hands. And aren't you glad? Just think what you all been through. The transition that you've been through just the last couple of years. Some, maybe some difficult times, but certainly a uh, transition, certainly a time where you're wondering who's going to be the pastor. And I'll remind you again, uh, this, this, uh, the church belongs to Jesus. Uh, it, it belongs to him. It's uh, his church and he holds it in his hands. Kind of reminds you of that old song, he's got the whole world in his hands. But he does have those that belong to him. He does have the world in his hands. And he does have Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Christ-exalting church. Pastored for 50 years. I, how many times I wring my hands and worry about some situation in the, the uh, four places that I, I pastored. One that I started from the very first day, another one uh, that I came when the mission pastor decided to leave after a couple of years, and I, I took that. It, that was a new church, and and I tell you, you you kind of, uh, as a pastor, uh, if your personality is such, you kind of take that into your hands, and you can uh, you can really get concerned and worry about the smallest of things. Someone leaving or moving or the finances or, or and, and, and you can really kind of take that on yourself. Well, uh, Jesus is saying here, Jesus is describing himself and he says, I hold these churches in my hand. I hold these pastors in my hand. Fact is, he holds you uh, in his hand. There's no, uh, only he, he described himself in that way. Uh, there's only one Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter four, verse four. But there are a number seven demonstrates the fullness and completion. The Holy Spirit gives life to the churches, and life is exactly what the people at Sardis needed. Uh, you know what it says there. It says, you're dead. That's what Jesus said to this church. And we don't want to jump ahead of that, but uh, we need to understand something. All of a church's man-made programs, everything, all the discipleship programs you come up with, Sunday school, church training, youth group, children's group, children's church, van ministries, your worship services, everything that a church, uh, man-made programs, they can never bring life to a church. That is not what it is. It really concerns me, and I've been through, I've walked that path, but it concerns me when I get to feeling young ministers that, uh, that I've either taught or that are pastoring somewhere, and it seems to be whenever you talk to them, it seems to be, you say, how's your church doing? And they say, well, man-made man uh, church programs can never bring life. It requires uh, uh, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus holds those spirits in his hands, the fullness, completeness of the Holy Spirit. Only one Holy Spirit, but, but, but he holds that in his hands. Uh, no more can a church bring life without the Spirit through its programs. No more than a circus can bring a corpse back to life. It, it, you just, it can't be done. 
the church was born when the Spirit of God, without the Holy Spirit, you may have the best of discipleship programs, the best of worship service, the best music, the best preacher, the best this and that, but without the Holy Spirit, there's no life there. The Holy Spirit is what brings life. It, it's what uh, it is. This, and whenever the Spirit of God is grieved, a church begins to lose its life because the Spirit is the life. A church begins to lose its power when, when the Holy Spirit is grieved. Now, we don't read that the Spirit here at Sardis. We just know they're living on their past because what's going on right now is lifeless. Jesus said those words. You were dead. Now, he, the, the, where it gets hard here, uh, is, uh, you know, is, is when you start trying to decide and people start trying to figure out why the life is gone, the power's gone out of a church. And the pastor's the first one that's gonna get blamed. Not saying that he's not in some cases, uh, but that's not always the issue. Uh, the Lord of the church must be the Lord of the church. And the Holy Spirit has to be alive. And the people of the church, the way to do that is to not grieve the Holy Spirit. Whatever might grieve the Holy Spirit, not living for him, not praying the way we should, not, uh, not uh, doing the things that we should, uh, will grieve the Spirit. Now, where it gets hard with this to stay with the outline, and I know I have to speed up. I know I do. Where it gets hard is that there's not really a commendation. Uh, uh, down there in verse 4, it does mention uh, there are some in that church that have not soiled their garments with sin. That's as close to a commendation as there is. Ephesus, I know how, how you've worked, how you've... Uh, Another one, how you're rich, but you're really poor, but you're rich with the Spirit. The, these were the commendations, but the closest thing come, coming to a commendation for the church at Sardis is they're not soiled uh, their garments with sin. That's kind of unique that Sardis was a, a town known for its manufacture of garments wool. Uh, it's kind of unique how the letter comes uh, to an end, too, that we'll get there, but again, dealing with garments. Uh, there's really no words of commendation uh, to the believers as a whole at Sardis, other than that line from verse 4. Uh, the Lord didn't point out any problems. There's really not Anything listed like the other churches listed, you know, the false teachers, the false doctrine, immorality, idolatry, all of those issues, not with Sardis. It doesn't say that. It doesn't really point out doctrinal problems. Uh, there's no mention of, of uh, opposition as there was in the other churches. No mention of, of, of persecution. It's not there. You read the other four letters that we've already, and we get into a couple more over the next couple of weeks. The other four had persecution and opposition of all kinds, and certainly false teaching going on. You don't hear that with the church at, at Sardis. Uh, the church would have been better off to be suffering in some way. Uh, for it had grown comfortable to recite what God has done in the past. 
God's interested in the present. God's interested in what he's doing in the present. And I, I can tell you, there are a lot of Sardis churches around. Now, someone might say, well, they don't have the charismatic leader or they, they, they don't have the right programs. Again, Sardis was relying on their programs for their life uh, rather than uh, relying on the Spirit. Uh, and it requires the Spirit. Uh, there is, was no reputation with re reality. The reality was they were a shadow of what they once were. And like the city itself, Sardis had uh, uh, glorified in the past the church there, but ignored the present. Uh, sometimes you just got to face reality. Sometimes you have to say, oh, what's going on? And you have to ask the question, that Peter asked, uh, in fact, several of the disciples asked at that first Lord's Supper when he said, someone's going to betray me. And, and they began to say, Lord, is it I? They did a self inventory. Is, is it I? So uh, the chastening's the same way. Verse uh, one and two, uh, uh, they have a reputation of being alive, but they're dead. Their deeds are far from right in God's sight, the Holy, Holy Spirit. And, and uh, you, you think, of it. in fact, even what they did was about to die because the believers had gone to sleep. Apathy had set in. Uh, the, the, the long history of Sardis, it had been captured at one time uh, through the, the, the centuries and uh, had failed to do so. Uh, they had not been faithful. Uh, but again, there's not a lot of chastening other than to just say, you're dead. You're dead. Without the Holy Spirit, let me tell you, you might as well shut the doors and go home. That's sad to say. It's anathema. It's death. The church has to have the Spirit of God moving, and the Spirit of God moving with power only does that when the Spirit is not grieved. You don't hear idolatry mentioned. You don't hear of immor immorality mentioned. You do hear of a, at least a remnant of people staying their apparel with the sins of the world. Uh, there was no real problems. And the impression that you get is the, that the assembly of Sardis was just not aggressive and they were apathetic about the things of God. They weren't terrible, rebellious, sinful, immoral, idolatrous people. They were just simply apathetic about keeping the spirit alive in their hearts and in the church. The council, verse three, and I want to read that verse three uh, there to you. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. That is the counsel. You need to remember, repent, and watch, and wait, and be ready, because I, 
I will come like a thief in the night. We've heard that in some of the other uh, New Testament writings. He will come as a thief in the night. The Lord's counsel to this church uh, said, be watchful and wake up, like Paul said in Romans 13, verse 11, post centuries. Uh, and and, and the wake up and be ready uh, for to come. And you know what? If there is, if there is a sin of churches today, it's apathy. You think about it. We're apathetic about the work of God. And I could bring that home personally. I can bring it home personally to my life. Have you witnessed to one person in the past week? Have you picked your Bible up this past week? Have you read it? Have you prayed? I mean, if we're not careful, we can come, become very apathetic. Our eyes wax dim about the condition of souls and, and that's the benchmark for our lives is the Spirit of God. And so he says, wake up. Uh, the the Lord, uh, Lord had warned the Ephesian saints that he would come and remove their lampstand. He warned the church at Pergamos that he would come and make war with the sword of the Spirit. And to the believers at Sardis who don't follow his orders, he would come like a thief in the night. And, and these are the warnings that, that have been given. This remnant of dedicated people often exist in a, in a small uh, church, a remnant of dedicated people. Uh, the Christians at Sardis had life a little bit, even though it was feeble. So if I was... You know, the, we had the, uh, the compromising church. We had the uh, church that law, left its first compromised, and now we have a church that's feeble. It's just hanging on. Just hanging on. Now, before I s spent the last year and a half here at West Tulsa, I've gone to... Uh, I preached in several churches, mostly in Oklahoma, a little bit uh, in Arkansas, uh, one church in Kansas State meeting, a couple churches in, uh, in Texas, one church in Texas. And uh, you know what? Our churches, if you describe a lot of our churches, they are feeble. They are feeble, weak, hanging on. Now, the one up in Kansas, the location I went to, wow, was full of life, full of energy. A old boy that had been saved out of sin, been the pastor there for 20 years, and uh, has a house full of people that had been saved uh, recently that he had led to the Lord, and they just, just seemed like they were, I'm not saying they didn't have weaknesses and problems. I don't know, but I'm just saying for the most part, uh, it's a few people hanging on, keeping a church, and it's feeble. And that's, that's sad. And like it, like in every one of the letters, and I close, every one of these letters, the f phrase, he that overcometh. He that overcometh. And for the church at Sardis, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Now just think of, how, of the theme here in these six verses. A, ch a church that existed in a town that's main manufacture was garments 
uh, wool garments, that's what Sardis was known for, is referred to the remnant of faithful believers in that church as a group that have stained their garments. And now for he that overcometh that same group that overcometh, I'm going to give you, uh, uh, the, the, uh, as it says there in verse 5, white raiment. You'll be clothed in white raiment. Talks about taking uh, names out of the book of life. Uh, I, I heard it expressed this way. Life has everyone. The book of life has all names in it. When a person dies without Christ, that name is no longer there. Now, I don't know the complete theology about that. I know that uh, he's not uh, going to take your name out uh, unless you, by your choice, but, but as far as this church family, at Sardis, doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. And so about that, he that has an ear, we've heard that before. We need to hear what the Spirit says. We need to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Sardis, Watch. Have the spirit. Don't be apathetic. Don't fall asleep. I'm coming like a thief in the night. You better watch. You better overcome. You better be strong. You better have power. That's the message of the church at Sardis. Thank the Lord for that. There's a, there's a, a formula. Wake up. Be watchful. Repent. Remember the word you've received and obey it. Kind of what the warning is. Overcome. Out of your word, we pray that you would bless your word. And again, Father, help us to make application in our own life, in our church life. And Lord, help us to never be looking backward. Always looking backward. Help us to look presently and look forward and be watching for your return. Help us to be overcomers, we pray in Jesus' name and amen. You're dismissed. Thanks.